There was a time when a part of downtown San Diego looked like this. It was a part of town that most people who lived in San Diego wouldn't come to after dawn. It was a police nightmare. But the leaders of the hometown baseball team and the leaders of the city worked together with their fans and citizens to turn that languishing, unproductive eyesore into this. This is the story of how a ballpark injected life into a long dormant spate of warehouses and created a new downtown neighborhood by the bay. It is a story of teamwork, turmoil, and triumph. It's Spotlight, a ballpark for San Diego, the story of Petco Park, and a great story about America's finest city. Hello, and thanks for joining us for A Ballpark for San Diego, the story of Petco Park. We bring you this tale now because a decade has passed since the ballpark first opened. What this neighborhood was like before the ballpark and the battles that it took to complete this project are fading memories. So here now are some reminders of the monumental effort it took to get this ballpark built and this neighborhood buzzing. The night of March 11, 2004 brought together San Diego icons who had poured their heart and soul into their town and their team. It was the first baseball game ever at Petco Park. A couple of weeks later, the park was ready for its first official National League regular season game. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome home, Padre fans. But the story of the ballpark began nearly a decade earlier, on December 21st, 1994, when John Moores and Larry Lucchino teamed up to buy and run the new San Diego Padres. We hope to, uh, to welcome the fans back. If there is a theme that we'd like to sound today, it is, uh, it is uh, come on back. We want you back. But when the opportunity did present itself to, to uh, buy the uh, Padres, it, uh, it almost felt just too good to be true, and right now it feels wonderful. Breath of fresh air. Uh, wanted to do great things, wanted to, have a, wanted to have a great baseball team. These were dark days for Major League Baseball. A player strike had canceled the 1994 World Series, and the economic disparities in baseball at that time had hit San Diego hard. The 1994 Padres had the worst record in baseball, the lowest revenue, the lowest season ticket base, and the lowest attendance in the game. The stone was at the bottom of the hill, and uh, we certainly thought part of the problem was the, uh, the uh, cavernous nature of, uh, of uh, Jack Murphy Stadium. When John Morris and Larry Lucchino bought the Padres, we met shortly after they bought, and they, one of the first things they said to me was that, oh, by the way, we need a new ballpark, which at that time, coming on the heels of the Charger deal, I said, that's nice, <laughs> and left it at that. The city was expanding Jack Murphy Stadium to accommodate the Chargers, who had just played in the Super Bowl. Their popularity had never been higher, and the Padres knew the expansion was necessary for the football team but enhancing the stadium for football actually made it much less intimate for baseball. The last thing in the world, uh, obviously a baseball team needed, was, was more seats. While we took unprecedented steps to make Qualcomm Stadium work for baseball, from palm trees in the outfield to new seating areas, new food courts, it was still a multi-purpose stadium. Fans here, maybe aside from those who had been to Lane Field and seen PCL Padres games, had never really experienced the small, intimate setting that modern-day ballparks could bring to a community. The best seats for football, high above the 50-yard line, are the worst seats for baseball. The best seats for baseball, down low near home plate, are the worst for football. The new Padres owners knew it would have been presumptuous of them to burst into town with talk of a new ballpark. Uh, we knew we had to win to reestablish some credibility and, uh, and to, uh, to uh, let the fans appreciate that we were committed to winning baseball and to entertaining baseball. 
the ball club's on-field credibility improved immediately. Just eight days after the new owners bought the team, the Padres and Astros pulled off the largest trade since the 1950s, a 12-player swap. Third baseman Ken Caminiti and outfielder Steve Findlay would instantly bolster the Padres at the plate and in the field. Line drive, straight away center field, hit pretty well, Findlay at the wall. The 1995 Padres were the most improved team in the league, and in 96, the Padres were the hottest ticket in town. A thrilling race came down to a final weekend showdown in, of all places, L.A., with San Diego needing to sweep the Dodgers to win the West. And that's just what they did. Get in the right center. That's in the gap. Henry will score easily. In just two seasons under new ownership, the Padres had gone from worst to first. <laughs> The day after winning the division, San Diego's mayor, Susan Golding, met with John Moores and Larry Lucchino to discuss the Padres' viability as co-tenants with the Chargers at Jack Murphy Stadium. Golding took critical action, forming a task force comprising 17 of the most credible local business leaders. They would volunteer their time to study the future of baseball in San Diego. The chairman of the mayor's task force on Padres planning was a trusted business leader with impeccable credentials, Ron Fowler. The Padres opened their doors and their books. We had complete access and, you know, if, if there were working uh, uh, documents that uh, we might uh, have wanted to back up some of the material we had, they were made available. John and Larry cooperated fully. They, they acted in a very transparent way. After nearly 10 months of studious scrutiny of the entire organization, the task force lauded the ball club for its community outreach, saying the Padres were, quote, exceptional corporate citizens and an important asset to the region. But the group's eyes were opened to how heavily the Moores family had subsidized the business. The surprise to me was how much money John had put in. And uh, he, uh, it was not a viable business. The task force concluded that it was economically impossible for the Padres to make ends meet as the secondary tenant in a shared stadium. Task Force One concluded that, uh, that a new ballpark would be a desirable thing both for the Padres and for San Diego. San Diego City Council then appointed a second task force to study where a new ballpark would most benefit the city and how it could be financed. For leadership, Mayor Golding turned to attorney and municipal finance expert Pat Shea. This task force was going to be the one that really engaged the public. The public needed to approve this, and everything we did was guided by that. The task force gathered tremendous public input, holding 56 open meetings. Not everybody who comes out is the person you'd like to invite to your party. My question is, why is it that the city of San Diego is getting involved in subsidizing another private enterprise? For several summers, I worked as a switchman uh, on the Santa Fe Railroad, so I think I know a, a, a railroad job when I see it. And those are the um, thoughts and energies and issues that you definitely want to have vetted because if this process goes where we hope it's going to go, which is it's going to acquit itself and we're going to build this, the one thing we're going to want to be able to tell people is everybody got a chance to speak up, and they all did. Nobody, nobody held back. There were no wallflowers. The task force on ballpark planning considered locations. John Moores liked the romance of the old Lane Field site at the waterfront on Broadway. Larry Lucchino heard the public's desire to remain in Mission Valley, and a beautiful setting would have been on the water in Chula Vista. The question of where a ballpark should be built and what type of ballpark should be built was, uh, as you might expect, controversial. How would you like that traffic downtown with the airport, emergency vehicles, the convention center, SeaWorld, and tourist attractions all downtown. I think you'd have a problem. The task force learned where the ballpark could best benefit San Diego, and it revealed its findings January 29th of 1998. The 
one place that sort of bubbled up to the top because it was the least attractive uh, and so it had the least number of people claiming an interest in it was downtown. Downtown, the East Village. Padres President Larry Lucchino had seen this downtown ballpark as a catalyst plan work before and he knew it could work again. While president of the Baltimore Orioles, he was the one with the vision for Oriole Park at Camden Yards, and he had overseen its development to national rave reviews in 1992. It revolutionized ballpark ambiance and architecture, and it revolutionized the role of a ballpark as a catalyst for redevelopment. Camden said this can be done, that this can change a city. Oriole Park at Camden Yards brought popularity and prosperity to underperforming areas and inspired more than 20 new ballparks that have improved the culture of America's downtown. With early victories from Camden's progeny in Cleveland in 1994 and Denver in 1995, Lucchino could see what a ballpark could do for San Diego. He shared that bit following a dinner in San Diego's gas lamp quarter in January of 1995. Not a lot was going on in the gas lamp at that time. We walked outside and Larry said, can you imagine if there were a ballpark just a couple blocks from here and after a game, it would tip over and pour all these people into the gas lamp and it would be filled with life and vitality. Lucchino had kept thoughts of that site relatively private while he listened to fans, but the task force agreed with his vision. The support of the community would be more intense in the area that nobody wanted as opposed to the place where there were other opportunities. The task force concluded that a ballpark for San Diego in the East Village would be a catalyst for redevelopment, creating the greatest benefit for all of San Diego. That was the thing that most closely replicated our experience with Camden Yards and the area that we thought had the greatest uh, upside. The greatest upside because the East Village had so much room for improvement. This whole area and the East Village area uh, was run down, did not appear to be able to pull itself up by its own bootstraps, and really for all intents and purposes looked like uh, a war-torn area. The historic Needle Exchange District, as some people called it, um, you know, this was a rough neighborhood. I remember today the smell and the syringes in the streets and the cyclone fencing and razor wire over lot after lot after lot. And I thought, wow, if they can do this, I looked at Larry and said, that is a huge undertaking. It needed a jolt, a serious jolt that could provide economic investment and economic viability. Mayor Susan Golding's task forces had concluded that the Padres were a valuable civic asset and that the best place to build a new ballpark would be downtown's downtrodden East Village. As for who would invest in a giant swath of downtown property with the ballpark as its core, the solution was a pioneering public-private partnership. We required the Padres to do things in real estate and development that no city had ever required of owners before. I mean, and they complained about it a lot, but we did that because we wanted to make it a redevelopment project, something good for the city. There were some really heated exchanges, and I would say no one laid down. From those battles, the city and the Padres at last created an agreement. It was the first time that a sports facility owned by a city required the tenant, the ball club, to redevelop the blocks and blocks around it. The Padres could play there, but they'd have to create a new downtown neighborhood by the bay. Significant economic development that, in fact, justified the city's investment. The Padres and John Moores were financially responsible for any construction cost overruns. It was a no-lose situation for the city. A lot of people said, wait a minute, isn't that a wonderful real estate play for John? It wasn't. We were scrambling really hard looking for business partners. Uh, we had a lot of people uh, that said they were interested and then, then dropped out. Although no public vote on the deal was required by law, the city and the Padres wanted the public's input. The first thing I said is I'm not doing it unless we agree to put it on the ballot. It never seemed reasonable to me to, to ask the public to pay for something without letting them vote on it. In November of 1998, the proposed ballpark and redevelopment project would go to a public vote. It would be Proposition C on the ballot. Baseball Commissioner Bud Sela came to San Diego, providing robust support and the wise perspective to let civic leaders know all that was at stake. This club can't be economically viable in the 21st century 
without a new ball plan. Newspaper ads ran and campaigners walked. Dreamers who could see the future spread the word and pictures of what they were imagining. You were designing from the ideal and you were dreaming and then you were turning those dreams into uh, beliefs and then into plans. To make that vision come alive for voters, you had to make the vision come alive. If citizens could see firsthand how new ballparks were enhancing the beauty and health of Baltimore, Cleveland and Denver, they could then just imagine how it would enhance a city as beautiful as San Diego. So, a great American ballpark tour took opinion leaders to see these sites and scenes of success. So we took dozens of families, 50 I think, 50 people, and we showed them this is what it could be. An expression was emerging in the, these conversations we were having. We were having them in abundance, and it was, this will be more than a ballpark. The tagline, it's more than a ballpark, uh, no tagline uh, was more accurate than that for this project. We are not going to do uh, Oriole Park or Camden Yards West. What we are going to do is a ballpark that looks and feels and tastes and smells and reflects San Diego. The vibrant, vivid vision inspired unlikely street corner campaigners. Rather than PB at the time, I was standing on the corners vote yes on C, waving at people, you know, I was like, now that I think about it, that was kind of crazy. It was San Diego at its best. It was lab organized labor. It was business. It was the civic entrepreneurs. It was uh, uh, people that really cared passionately about baseball and people that wanted to improve our downtown. The leadership of the parties had to actually go into the neighborhoods, sit down, as we say, break bread, accept questions, and give answers. He, Charles, and John went everywhere to share their passion and share their vision. Every time someone says it's a ballpark for the Padres, and we would stop the conversation and say this is a ballpark for San Diego. And this is about bringing tax dollars uh, into an area that was a tax drain for the city. A key element of the coalition was the Independent Committee of 2000, citizens with no connection to the ball club who volunteered thousands of hours to spread the vision. Tony Gwynn could see the writing on the wall the right field wall at Qualcomm Stadium. Every day when I ran out to right field, I'd, you know, I'd see that sign and I knew that us winning was gonna have a, hopefully have an effect on getting this ballpark done. We knew that if we don't win, baseball may never exist here in San Diego ever again. While visions of a new ballpark were spreading, Kevin Towers and Bruce Bochy were fielding one of the best teams in baseball. They could hit. They could hit with power. This one is hit deep down the left field line. It might be, and it is number 50 for Greg Ball. And they could hit in the clutch. A high fly ball to deep right field. Way back. Get back. Well slammed. Home run, Steve Finley. The Padres win. They could feel. Caminiti to his knees. Over the first. Got him. And before this season, the already strong pitching staff was bolstered by the addition of ace Kevin Brown. Strike three, that's the ball game. Kevin Brown ends it with a strikeout, his 11th of the game, a new career high. That was entirely uh, uh, Kevin Towers. Kevin put the deal together. He knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, he. He knew why it was a good deal. He knew how long it would last. We probably went beyond our means financially that year because they knew that uh, there was a lot at stake, you know, for them personally and for the city. And uh, we needed to field a good ball club. It was a great ball club, one that reminded us of the romance of baseball. And when they led in the late innings, as they often did, the bells tolled and opponents' bats went cold. Now pitching for the Padres, number 51, Trevor Hoffman. Trevor Hoffman shut down foes with a team record 53 saves in 54 tries. Struck him out, and that's the ball game. Finally, the Padres reached an enormous milestone on September 12th of 1998, one of the greatest comebacks in their history. With the chance to clinch the West against the rivals from LA, the Padres trailed 7-0. It seemed the title would have to wait. 
It's been all Los Angeles tonight. The Dodgers with a 7-0 lead. But one small ray of hope fired up Friars fans who had learned to keep the faith. Here's a well-hit ball to right field. Way back there. And goodbye. There goes the shutout. And then here's a line drive down the left field line. Base hit. Greg Myers will come in to score. Sheets being waved home. And he will score. In the sixth, in a dizzying display of hits, runs, and errors, the Padres took the lead. He rips one into left field. The Padres take the lead. Andy Sheets is in the score. Here comes Gomez. The throw by Matt Luke, and Gomez is out at home. The Padres have rallied from a 7-0 deficit to take the lead. 8-7. Can you believe it? That, of course, led to Trevor Todd. Struck him out, and the Padres have done it. The Padres reign as the 1998 National League Western Division champions. For the second time in four years under John Moores and Larry Lucchino, the Padres were going to play postseason baseball. In the first game of the division series, Kevin Brown outdueled future Hall of Famer Randy Johnson, striking out 16 Astros in a pitching battle for the ages. That set the tone as the Padres took the series three games to one. In the sixth and deciding game of the National League Championship Series, Sterling Hitchcock and four relievers allowed the Braves just two hits in a shutout. Finley, 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 he's under, he's got it, and the Padres draped the National League flag around their shoulders for 1998. The whole doctor! When that season of heroes extended all the way to the World Series, the love of baseball and its power to unite a community were at a high. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to Qualcomm Stadium for Game 3 of the 1998 World Series. In the World Series, the winningest Yankees team in history prevailed, but fans in San Diego celebrated the pennant-winning Padres with a grand parade. The Padres had brought pride, unity, and positive national attention to their city. Less than two weeks later, November 3, 1998, with the future of Major League Baseball in San Diego on the line, voters went to the polls to decide that future. There's no reason to think that the Padres wouldn't have ended up somewhere else, but I had no interest, zero interest, uh, in, in moving the, the ball club somewhere else. Sure, I was nervous. I'd, I'd spent, um, as, as many in the, in the organization had, um, uh, spent a lot of time uh, campaigning. Go Padres! It was gonna be decisive for the future of the Padres, make no mistake about that. San Diegans turned out at the polls and voted resoundingly for a new ballpark with nearly 60% in favor. The citizens had spoken and the citizens had saved Major League Baseball in San Diego. We are not just talking about the preservation of baseball or the transformation of downtown, but really the shaping of the city in the years ahead. We got 59.7% of the vote, huge. I don't think I'll ever have something like that happen again. That was a, truly a once in a lifetime kind of moment. Everyone was very excited about the unique opportunity that that brought. 26 square blocks, basically to the dirt, enabled us to start from scratch, redo roads and the downtown grid. I know everybody viewed this as an extraordinary once in a lifetime opportunity. The next morning, um, we scheduled a meeting first thing in the morning. Uh, I believe it was 8 o'clock. Uh, we all had a little bit of fog in our eyes um, after the celebration, uh, but we wanted to demonstrate to the community that um, we were ready to get to work. Um, this, this was not something that uh, was the end of the story. It was, in fact, just the beginning of the story.
In November of 1998, voters overwhelmingly approved a ballpark for San Diego. But construction didn't begin right away because there were design details and environmental reports to complete. In early 1999, the design of Petco Park reached full speed. HOK, a firm experienced in designing modern ballparks, came aboard. But to give the park a unique San Diego feel, the renowned Antoine Predock brought his architectural artistry to the drawing board as well. We decided, let's break ground fast. Let's start this thing going so that nobody gets cold feet and gets moving. But we didn't have the financing in place. The, the Padres didn't have theirs and the city didn't have theirs. So we started saying, well, the city can come up with 10 million. If you guys can come up with 10 million, we'll break ground. We'll start doing some stuff. And so we did it. Even when things look bleak, that was the real genius of Larry. He would not accept stop as an answer. We've got to go through demolition. We've got to start the ballpark construction. And I believe today, looking back on it, had that ballpark construction not started when it did, it may well have led to everything you see here not happening. And folks forget it was the largest redevelopment project in, uh, uh, in the United States. In keeping with the vision to look and feel like San Diego, plants and flowers and trees would remind you of Carlsbad's flower fields. Stone on the facade of the ballpark was chosen to match the bluffs in Del Mar. Centerfield would open up to a park at the park where families could congregate and where children could play whether there was a ball game or not. The park at the park reminded Larry Lucchino of his childhood field of dreams, Pittsburgh's Forbes Field. That concept was reinforced on a visit to Japan. I went to a ball game and I saw right across from the, uh, from the ballpark, just across a small street, a, a public park. And it seemed like a great idea to, uh, to bring those two together. To help make the vision tangible, the Padres called upon their heroic native son to show fans where the right field foul pole would stand. Baseball is about hopes and dreams. Like everyone here today, I love the game. There is one person here today that represents the greatness of baseball more than anyone else, and that is Ted Williams. Raise the foul pole. On February 10th of 2000, a wrecking ball began knocking down the first of the many vacant warehouses. <laughs> Saving a connection to the Old West, the Padres preserved the Western Metal Supply Company building. The old family business had provided horseshoes and wagon parts to pioneers more than 100 years before. Preservationists also called for the saving of the Sholey Brothers Candy Factory, which had to be ever so gently moved creating space for a ball field at the park at the park. From placing the left field foul pole at the corner of Western Metal Supply to having the concourse run right through it, the phrase, God is in the details, came to life. The detail, attention to detail that Larry and his team had was really extraordinary. The steel had been ordered and much of it had arrived. Paradise in progress was underway. Three, two, one. But despite the landslide victory at the polls, some of the defeated tried to stop the progress in court. We were confident that uh, we shouldn't let these lawsuits uh, derail us, uh, that that would be a uh, terrible way to uh, run the railroad. The incessant lawsuits delayed the financing, and with the Padres already overextended in funding the construction, San Diego's longest rain delay started on October 2nd of 2000. The people in San Diego mandated this stadium be built. And all of a sudden, everything just stopped. Unfortunately, during that period of time when Larry kept everyone focused on moving the project forward, there were new personalities and new people who were coming into John Moore's inner circle, many of whom didn't agree with the strategy of moving forward to keep the ballpark process alive, which led to the untimely and unfortunate fracturing of the moores lucino relationship and ultimately to Larry leaving to go to Boston and taking so many of us who had worked so hard to make Petco Park a reality with him. Nearly 
two years after voters approved a new ballpark, lawsuits lingered, scaring off lenders and making financing impossible. As battles were waged in court, the beginnings of a ballpark for San Diego sat silently by, a costly delay. We had a lot of steel in the ground, we had a lot of concrete out there. Uh, we in fact, in order to meet the schedule, um, had ordered all of the steel for the project. You don't just you know, put the wrench down and walk off from the job site, you have to shut it down. I think our shutdown and restart costs were in the order of 25 to 30 million dollars. A lot of these lawsuits have to do with, oh, don't spend city money or we're going to save you money. In, in, in the end, most of these lawsuits simply cost the taxpayers money. The litigation delay wore on and on. The defeated kept filing suits, kept losing suits, and kept filing suits. You paid the bucks for the e-ticket, you can't get off. They're not going to stop the ride halfway through because you're getting a little queasy about things. We couldn't get off, but uh, there, were, there were lots and lots and lots of days uh, where I didn't know that we'd ever, ever get it done. Along the way, Mayor Golding's terms concluded and Dick Murphy became San Diego's new mayor. As the delay grew to 13 and 14 months, the Padres continued to polish and perfect plans for the ballpark. We had full construction drawings. We had 1,300 pages of blueprints. Uh, this thing had been thoroughly planned. But the ballpark site sat inactive as lawsuit after lawsuit was filed, 17 in all. But the Padres were unbeaten in the courtroom. You needed to win them all, and we did. Like a salmon swimming upstream against amazing forces here that tried to stop this, and the good guys won. Defeated in the courts, the obstructionists asked the government to investigate John Moore's friendship with a city official. John, of course, was completely exonerated, but the ordeal was particularly painful. That was pr a pretty miserable period. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't wish that kind of misery on anybody. But I believe with this city staff and this city council that we will complete the journey. Despite the turmoil, under the new mayor, the city council voted again on the ballpark plans and again voted their approval. With the ballpark designed to a T, Larry Lucchino accepted Tom Werner's invitation to try and buy the Boston Red Sox, a successful effort in which they partnered with Florida Marlins owner John Henry. And in San Diego, construction mercifully resumed February 28th of 2002 after a 16-month delay. This was not an easy victory. I mean, we, they, they really had to fight to make sure that this thing uh, went through. Construction moving full speed ahead, the ballpark began to take shape. As promised, a new East Village neighborhood was forming around the ballpark as well. This became the place to build in San Diego. Still, no one expected this. Private investors were rushing to build high rises that not only brought business downtown, they brought residents and tax dollars that would pay for the city's portion of the ballpark. In January of 2003, the ballpark was named. Uh, this is a fun day for us, and it's also fun for me to say this. Welcome to Petco Park. Uh, <laughs> Finally, in March of 2004, the first exhibition game was played at Petco Park as the Padres hosted San Diego State. Moores invited Lucchino to throw the first pitch. Behind the plate, San Diego State's baseball coach, Hall of Famer, Tony Gwynn. I threw a breaking ball away, and uh, uh, he made a nice little play on it, and uh, we celebrated. I think that's what we all kind of dreamed about, having our own place we could call home. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Petco Park and the first ever Padres game. Thursday, April 8th of 2004, Petco Park hosted its first regular season Major League game. Former President Jimmy Carter threw the first pitch to his good friend, John Moore. Jimmy Carter! The game was a thrilling 10-inning win 
over the Giants. Sit, get down, get down, and now the Padres win! Hello, Petco! How you doing? The Padres finally have their own place to call home. Park opened in 2004 to plenty of fanfare. Its beauty, great sight lines for baseball, and family-friendly atmosphere were attracting Padres fans in record numbers. But that was just the beginning. San Diego was on its way. The East Village was growing at an unprecedented pace, and the Padres were back too. People flocking downtown fueled the Friars in that first season. They drew more than 3 million fans and succeeded in reaching postseason play in 2005 and 2006. The Padres are Western Division champs in 2005. It was the first time the National League Padres had played October baseball in back-to-back -back years. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Gwynn. Year after year, Petco Park was the site of historic moments. In its first season, Hall of Famer Tony Gwynn's number 19 was retired. And like it or not, it was here that Hank Aaron's all-time home runs record was matched. There it is, number 755. Trevor Hoffman set baseball's career record for saves on this turf. Two-third, backhanded by the shortstop, Blum got a hurry, got him! Yes! 479! Trevor Hoffman has become the all-time saves leader in Major League Baseball history, and they're all chasing him. And the next season, Trevor became the first ever to earn 500 saves. 500 saves for Trevor Hoffman. He's gonna have a plaque right next to yours in Cooperstown someday, Mr. Gwynn. All that meant that no other Padre would ever again wear his number 51. <laughs> Petco Park has been the stage for breakfast, and of course lunch, and dinner. It has hosted soccer, rugby, rockers, zombies, and it has been the community gathering place in which San Diego honors its beloved heroes. Petco is also at Classic Moments, hosting two World Baseball Classics. As promised, a ballpark for San Diego is about more than baseball. The businesses, the hotels, the restaurants, the bars that benefit from having people downtown, I think have also created a magnet for people to want to come and live downtown. In its 10th anniversary season, Petco Park hosted Tennis's Davis Cup. Petco Park is great for Padres games and baseball, but it's also very appealing for a plethora of other events as well. And we're working very hard with the community to make Petco Park a 12-month-a-year venue. That ingenuity has helped enliven this ballpark under enlightened new leadership. Ironically, it's that first task force chairman, Ron Fowler, who joined forces with lead investor Peter Seidler and his family, who have a great baseball heritage. In search of a leader who understands San Diego and Petco Park, they asked Mike D to return. New ownership is committed, Peter Seidler, Ron Fowler, to making sure that Petco Park is not just here for the next 10 or 20 years, but hopefully one day we'll too celebrate its 100th birthday and be a part of the downtown landscape in San Diego for generations to come. And who knows, maybe even we can convince Major League Baseball that this would be a great place to host the All-Star Game.
Petco Park has delivered even more than it promised. There is no question that Petco Park has exceeded the wildest expectations of what the redevelopment would be around it. It's hit well over three billion, but that's gonna to continue to grow. Every day we see development um, projects getting approved. We produce tax revenue downtown that gets spread out over the whole city, and a vibrant downtown and a vibrant business community downtown keeps the city alive. They said it would be good, they, un they undershot the runway. It's been unbelievable. It was pretty clear that we had three times the cash flow we needed to service the bonds. Therefore, the other two times cash flow was coming into the city in one form or another, and we were benefiting from it. They also say baseball uh, in San Diego, and, and it was, it was their, our second, second great saving uh, opportunity. And this time it was the people themselves that stood up and saved the sport and saved it permanently. The old adage says victory has a thousand fathers, defeat is an orphan. Petco Park has a thousand fathers and mothers, from the fans who voted for this, to Susan Golding and Dick Murphy, to Ron Fowler and Pat Shea, to Tony Gwynn and Trevor Hoffman, to Commissioner Bud Selig, to of course, Larry Lucchino and John Moores. There are many who deserve thanks for the greatest sports victory in San Diego's history. Thank God, because this place and this team means a whole lot to people, and the loss would have been absolutely catastrophic. Really the credit to me goes to the ownership that was here at that time, as well as our fans civic pride and people getting behind a club and wanting a club and voting to build a new venue like this is really our, the fans in the city. People that are true blue Padre fans here deserve that. And it's a beautiful ballpark. Um, it's something they should be proud of. We wouldn't have these walls around us right now if it weren't for that season and that team and uh, that emotional cry from our city. This ballpark has suddenly many fathers. Uh, and uh, uh, the truth is it has two, and it's John Morris and Larry Lucchino. Having an opportunity to see it grow, uh, coming out here in a dirt lot with, with me and Carlos throwing BP to each other and having nothing around but uh, this one day of, uh, of a great ballpark. And some people had some great vision, great vision for, for Petco, for San Diego, uh, the Moores and Lucchinos. The uh, they did a great job in putting this together, and uh, here we sit today with a great ballpark. On its 10th anniversary, Petco Park can be celebrated not only for its baseball memories, but for being downtown San Diego's hub of energy and for being the catalyst that revived this neighborhood. We leave you now with some final thoughts on Petco Park's first 10 years. I think this is probably the most significant achievement in the history of this county. Uh, all you gotta do is look around you here. I mean, this, this, is, this is astonishing. It might have happened over a hundred years or a thousand years, but it certainly wouldn't have happened in a decade. Gosh darn it, it happened. It worked. This has a, an inertia that just keeps moving. It just keeps moving. We have one of the best downtowns in the country now. We do. A bar none. This ballpark saved baseball for San Diego. And now as we embark on the second decade in 2014, we feel an enormous sense of responsibility to not only continue the great legacy that's been established, but to also take those unfulfilled promises and make San Diegans proud, not just of the ballpark, but of the Padres on the field and off. The luster of San Diego as a gorgeous place, as a national jewel, it shines more brightly than ever. We should use this experience to, to try to, to keep dreaming. There is not a time that I come to Petco, and we have season tickets, that I don't get a little teary-eyed and say, wow, look what our city did. Look, I mean, look what we did.